Already know Tony Perucci, curator of Lake County Museums uh, in Lakeport, in Lower Lake. And we're working hard on getting Gibson to join his fold. <laughs> Aren't we, Tony? We are. <laughs> we are? Yep. We're really hopeful about that. Uh, you all know that Tony wrote this beautiful book full of wonderful photos, many of which appeared in the Press Democrat. And now he's going to tell you about that. It's yours, Tony. Thank you. Well, actually, it's going to be a little bit different today because we have um, a current principal here who's going to talk to us about some of the challenges that, that Lake County schools are facing today, um, in particular in relation to the recent fires. So I want to talk a little bit about some of the historical challenges that schools have, rather than you know giving you a, a whole history of education in Lake County. Um, and in many ways, the issues that they faced back then are still being faced by some communities today. Um, the first one being just attendance. Um, in fact, there are four counties in California who have school districts that are at the edge of not having enough students to justify the existence of a school. California law has been pretty standard ever since the 1860s that you needed at least 10 children in a given school district to justify a separate school. Um, this all started with the grandfather of public education in California. His name was John Sweat. Does anyone know him? Know of him? A few, hey, yeah? He fundamentally altered the way that we teach our children. He came in and became the uh, superintendent of public instruction for the entire state of California in about 1862. So this is already 10 years after California had been a state proper. It was in the middle of the Civil War. Um, he came in where, in a situation where rural counties didn't really have public schools. When Lake County became a county in 1861, there were two schools. We should use the word school lightly because we know that one of them was taught off and on from a, um, a shed on a farm whenever it was nice weather out. And the problem was because they just didn't have enough money. At the time, people didn't want to pay taxes to teach children for free. It wasn't considered a public good. You had people very much like today in some ways say, you know, why should I pay for someone else's benefit? You know, why should I pay to teach my neighbor's children? Today, it's kind of a no-brainer. We see education, free education, as a common good. Uh, but for many, many decades in the 1800s, that was a constant battle. John Sweat came in. He passed legislation that allowed for and required each county to raise at least $2 per census child. And that, along with the passing of state school taxes, was allowed rural communities to raise enough money and then pass some bonds to build a schoolhouse and operate a school. So with the ability to build a school, and with the 10-child minimum, as areas became more populated, schools started sprouting up every six miles or so. In Lake County, throughout the 1870s, there were new schools created every three, three every year. And it became from 14 schools in 1870 all the way up to 38 in 1880. They just exploded. And in many ways, it was because parents wanted to have control over how their children were taught. The way the laws worked, each district was basically run by elected officials. Uh, they were called school trustees. So each district had two to five elected trustees who entered in personal contracts with teachers. They hired and fired teachers. And the superintendent at the county level just whoo, kind of herded them, make sure that they were following rules. You know, there wasn't much direct contact. In fact, over here at the Great Western Mine, which is just down the road up on the hill there, we know from people's mem uh, memories and entering into journals and writing about it in memoirs that the superintendent of the Great Western Mine was one of the only two trustees there, and his wife was the one who always hired and fired the teachers. So it was a very personal thing. And with having a, a school for your children, you can have a very much a direct contact and a direct say in how they were taught and who taught them more so than today. So with the law allowing enough money to be raised, and with there being kind of a minimum set, just you know at least 10 children, Every family wanted to have a school for them. So you had something in rural Lake County where some schools only had 10 to 12 students. And all it took was a single family moving away for your district to drop below that 10 child minimum. So the 1800s, the history of education in Lake County and a lot of rural areas in California was this very uncertain. It was this constant um, lapsing of school districts, creating of new ones. And that was kind of uh, hectic for the families, because you can imagine that you're, one day your kids can go to school that was just half a mile down the road, but if a family moved out, suddenly your kid has to go six miles to the, other, the new school district school. 
That was one of the biggest challenges, and it didn't stop with the close of the 1800s. It continued. We have letters from the Cash Creek School District and the Long Valley School District in 1937 talking about the issue of having enough students. Um, we have a series of letters that were written from the state level down to the superintendent of Lake County School saying, you, inter you gave us some data that showed that the Long Valley School District only had an average attendance of two students every day. You need to lapse the district. And so that was one of the major challenges that people had. It largely closed by the, the beginning of the 20th century, but it still persisted. What took its place as a serious issue in Lake County uh, was segregation. Um, Lake County had segregated schools until 1934. Uh, unlike schools in the American South, the segregated students weren't African American. They were entirely Native American. And that's because California law up until the 1930s or so dictated that you can have segregated schools only if there were at least 10 students of that particular color. So only if there was enough students of that race to justify the creation of a separate school district. Lake County never had a significant population of African Americans, so that they never had that issue. So African American students were always taught within the white schools because they had to be, that was the law. There was never a significant population of Mexican Americans until the 1930s and 1940s in Lake County, so that was never an issue. There were a lot of Chinese Americans, but they were primarily just you know, single men who were working the mines, they didn't have families. So primarily it was the Native American population in Lake County. And Lake County had a significant population of Native Americans. In 1910, the 300 men, women, and children in the Upper Lake Tribe represented the largest population of non-reservation Native Americans in all of Northern California. So the Indian question, as it became known, was a hot topic here in Lake County in the early 20th century. And it was one that a lot of the challenges that this county underwent um, had a huge impact on education and Native Americans in California as a whole. So we are actually unique in that sense that a lot of the issues by virtue of us having a large population, we kind of worked out the issues that would, would greatly affect the way that uh, certain students were taught throughout California. The white population had begun learning how to deal with the Indian question since the very beginning when they, the white settlers came here and wholesale kicked the Native Americans off their property. In 1851-52, a representative of the United States entered into treaties with all the Native Americans in California. They promptly lost those treaties and they were found again in the early 20th century. Of course, in that 50 year span, people had settled down. The, the settlers had given birth to children, their children to more children, and it had firmly established a, a continuity of, of the settlement patterns. And the Native Americans had largely... Hi. The Native Americans had largely um, become itinerant farm laborers. They would go between here in Lake County working maybe the, the green beans and going over to Mendocino County to work the hops. They had entered into this kind of thing. Now, haphazardly, some of the tribes had bought up property themselves. But by the 1910s, and just before that, the turn of the century, many of the Native Americans in, Cal in Lake County in particular had no property to speak of. And so the issue of, well, how do we deal with people that aren't citizens of the United States, aren't citizens of the local government, aren't, and have no land to speak of. So Native Americans earlier, very early on became considered wards of the federal government. It was the Fed's problems not the local government's problem to deal with. This, of course, began to change, and it wasn't out of some sense of, you know, um, moral inclination or anything like that. It's the one thing that pushes government to do everything, and it was money. It was a lack of money. The federal government was tired of educating and spending the money on Native American education. Um, how many of you have heard of the Sherman Institute in Riverside? The Sherman Institute. There were about three boarding schools for Native Americans in California. And if you talk with um, families today, there is, in, exists in the family oral tradition of some Native American children being taken from their families and sent to the boarding schools. Um, by and large though, because we had such a large population of non-reservation Indians here, the federal government took on a different approach. And the approach they took on was to operate what was called day schools. They would open up this building and paid for by the federal government, bring in a teacher paid for by the federal government, and teach the Native American children in the area. 
At any one time, there was about two or three day schools in Lake County, um, primarily al along the Upper Lake area because that was where a large population. The Big Valley Native Americans were taught off and on by the Catholic priests who operated St. Terribius' mission. But when that closed in 1915, it was, again, the issue was posed, well, who educates these children? They're, meant, they're wards of the federal government, and so you see local officials reading the newspapers here of, we don't want, we don't, it's not a race thing, they said. It's not that we're racist, we just, it's better that they are taught with their own people, and it would be too difficult to integrate the cultures. It's not a race issue. That we're, we don't have race lines, they said. We have a wonderful African-American student at Clear Lake Union High School, and see, he gets along just fine. That, that was the, the litany that they, they told themselves. This all came to a head in 1923 with a landmark, at least in, in a regional sense, landmark legal case. It was Noreen Davis et al. versus the Middle Creek School District. Noreen was from the Middle Creek School District, up by Lake, um, Upper Lake at the time, and she was a part of the Upper Lake Pomo tribe. Um, and as part of a large community of Native Americans, the BIA had been operating a day school since at least 1910. So it had been about 13 years that these children had been operated by the federal government, or been educated by the federal government. And ironically, they were being educated in a building owned by the tribe. The tribe was leasing out the building to the federal government to educate their children. Well, the parents were sick and tired of this. I mean, we can imagine the education was, was probably subpar because eventually the, the tribe said they actually kicked the federal government out. They said, we're not renewing your lease. And that forced the issue. Suddenly, we had to figure out who is going to educate the Native Americans in Lake County. And the question had not yet been answered anywhere else in California. So this was a new question. And in an attempt to force the issue even more, the parents sued the Middle Creek School District saying that it was the county's responsibility to educate the children. And the school district said, no, 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 it's not. It's a federal problem. And probably we would, we would hope that this would end in some kind of wonderful way of it goes to court and, you know, the judge finds in favor of the Native Americans and segregation ends in Lake County. <laughs> History is not always that, you know, we would love that, but that's not the case. Judge Sayer at the time ruled and he said, Yes, a writ of mandate needs to be issued to commanding Middle Creek School District to pay for the education of the, the, the Pomo children. So in one sense, that answered the question. It was going to be from this point on the county's issue. It was no longer going to be a federal problem. It was going to be a local problem. But then he vacillated. And then he said, but they could also operate a segregated school if they want to. Well, Middle Creek School District didn't have enough money to build a whole new school, schoolhouse for the Native American children. So they just built a, a wall down the middle of their classroom, and the Native Americans were taught on one side and the white children on the other. And they did the same. They built a, a fence down the, the playground. And you, you read diaries of, of white children who went to school at this time, and they remember you know, playing on one side of the fence and the Native American children on the other, and they would talk and chat, but largely it was a, a, a segregated. And no... I mean, this was just a, a blatant case of, you know, upholding the separate but equal that had been decided about three decades earlier in Plessy v. Ferguson, right? And that was a situation in Lake County um, largely until the early 1930s when it just no longer became financially feasible with the Depression for the county to pay for two different schools. And so, again, it wasn't some moral inclination. It was a lack of money <laughs> that forced integration eventually to take place. And the last segregated school in Lake County was the Westlake Indian School, which closed its doors in 1934. So that was the two problems that persisted the uh, tried Lake County schools. The 1800s was a lack of attendance. And that did persist in some ways into the 20th century with smaller rural districts. But by and large, the problems that schools had to face was the question of integration. So we like to think that California was a place that this didn't happen. You know, I grew up and I, you learn about segregation in school, but it's a southern problem. You know, maybe the East Coast, but no way California. California was a haven for, you know, civil rights, right? But this wasn't always the case. So that's that on that happy note. <laughs> and I'd love to answer any questions that you have, or if we want to wait and, and, and hear from it. <clears throat> Let's have David talk to us a little bit. Great. And then we'll have a question period, okay? Great. Hi. 
this is uh, this is a little atypical for me. I'm not typically a speaker. I prepared a few notes just to kind of keep myself on board. So if you see me referring, uh, that's why. I thought I'd start telling you a little bit about my experience. Um, I've been in the in education for this will be my 13th year, and of of those uh, 13 years, this will be my second year as an administrator. Last year was my first year as a principal at Cobb Elementary School, and um, it was a, I was an intern, so I didn't yet have my administrative credential. I got my credential as I went through the school year. So it's a really interesting year, as you can imagine. You know, the words trial by fire certainly come to mind and have been said more than once. Um, but I, I do love teaching. It's, uh, it's one of my passions, for sure. And um, I had the joy of teaching my daughter one year, which was really great to have that, that opportunity. Cobb Schools, I don't know how much, how much all of you know about Cobb School. It's a small school, uh, which is one of the reasons I think it is so successful. Uh, all the teachers know all the kids intimately because you just can name every single child. Um, last year, we started our year off, uh, and just to tell you, I've taught uh, three years of kindergarten and eight years of either second and third grade or a straight third grade. Combination classes are very common at Cobb School. Uh, as they are at Mini Cannon and at Coyote Valley as well. So the uh, last year was quite a quite a, an interesting year. We started our year off with 163 kids, and um, after the Valley Fire, we were out of school for about two weeks, and then uh, Catherine Stone, our our new superintendent, who is I just really love working with. She got us back into our classrooms within two weeks, which was a, a pretty astounding feat in my opinion. Um, Cobb School was not able to go back for three more weeks because we had, um, we had experienced a greater amount of infiltration of soot and smoke damage in the, in the attics of our buildings. And so there was a great deal of cleanup that had to be done for each of those classrooms before we could return. So the, the amazing thing, I think, was that we had, um, of those 163 kids, we had a 155 come back after the fire, wow. um, which is really astounding. Uh, and it speaks, I think it speaks volumes about why Cobb School is so successful and, and um, a wonderful place to work, because the, uh, the community is just so, so deeply supportive of our school. That's one of the major reasons we're successful. Um, as the year progressed, we were down to about 80% of that 163. I think we ended with 144 students by the end of the year. So Nina had asked me to talk a little bit about the challenges, well, maintaining our success, how, how we plan on doing that, and um, a little bit about this last year, and moving forward, how do we, how do we maintain that success, and what are our goals, and, uh, what are our challenges? So I'll try to touch on, on that a little bit. Um, but I also wanted to tie it in, tie it in a little bit to what uh, Tony's been here talking about. So um, if, if I look fo forward towards the future uh, and our success, I think you really need to look back in the past to see what's worked. I also studied archaeology. That was my, my major in college. And so I have a passion for prehistory, but not so much history. Um, but we need to look back in the past to see what worked. and um, in order to see what you can build from, you know, look at what you what you've been successful in doing, and um, and I, it makes me think of Leslie Egan. Every day I walk onto the campus, there's a sign that says Leslie Egan Community Center, and that's right above our multi-use room and cafeteria. And Leslie Egan is the the teacher who was the teacher at the Little Red Schoolhouse for I imagine decades. And I read Tony's article this morning about the the school marm being either the hero or the villain of the town. And I just really love that. You know, we all have seen that characterized so many times, both in, in um, movies and in, you know, growing up watching cartoons. And um, I'm assuming Leslie was, a, was one of the heroes, not the villains. Otherwise, they wouldn't have named our community center building <laughs> after her. But um, right now, the Little Red Schoolhouse is being utilized uh, as the Valley Fire Recovery Center up in Cobb. And again, you know, educators are at the heart of every community. Um, 
you have four educators, I think actually six educators presently working at the Recovery Center, um, four of whom are retired. I think all of them are Dave Geck, who was a former superintendent of the county. Um, you've got Rose Geck, who was a, a kindergarten teacher down in Lower Lake. Larry Allen was a teacher on Cobb. Uh, and Sue Allen, who was a kindergarten teacher and a mentor of mine over at Coyote Valley. And they've been uh, steadfast in their commitment to Cobb's recovery by being there three days a week at the Little Red Schoolhouse, organizing the endless flow of donations and uh, seeking out the things that people need. So, you know, just kind of neat to see the tie-in to that as well in, in this, this whole process of recovery. And the Mountain Lions, um, the Lions Club, the Mountain Lions, as they're known up there, have also been integral in the success of that recovery project. And I can uh, say that I know our family is grateful. Um, as far as the success of, of Cobb School, I would, I would equate it to several things. Um, one of them is certainly the setting, and it is just as beautiful now as it was before, even though we have vast swaths of destroyed forest and burnt out forest, but um, the, the actual setting of Cobb School is still pretty idyllic and um, really grateful for that. Um, another, another reason, a, a primary reason, I think, that our school is so successful is our community. Our community is so strong in, in the support of the school. and. Um, I think I don't definitely have a reason as to why that is, other than there's not a whole lot going on up in Cobb, and it is sort of a, a hub. Um, you know, 4-H happens there in the evenings, and um, but I think elementary education in particular, you get this tremendous amount of support for kids, uh, and it's astounding to me how many volunteers we have on a, on a regular basis. And they help us to really give a broad curriculum. Um, basically, I, I know as a kindergarten teacher there, I had parents coming in on a daily basis so I could really differentiate instruction for our kids. Um, and, and that's one of the biggest challenges in, in any school, not just Cobb school, is you have, uh, and talking about immigration and, and segregation, you have such a vast level of difference, and Seamus is here as well, who's a teacher, and I'm sure he could chime in on this as well. You always, in any given class, you know, even if you have a straight grade, you're going to have two, possibly three different grade levels of ability, just given, not to anyone's fault, but just because some people have a readiness level that's different than others. And so that's one of the greatest challenges, no matter where your school is located. Um, one of the other strengths I think Cobb School has is that um, in the past we've had a tremendous amount of support from the Cobb artist community. They've always given us donations so we could provide art supplies for our kids. Um, the, the fact that, you know, No Child Left Behind has come and gone, hooray that it's gone. <laughs> in my opinion, I'm just saying, and, that, and that's not because I don't think we need to be accountable for our, our uh, for our students' education, but the the goals were unmeetable. You know, 100% proficiency is when you have special education and things of that nature. Um, but we never. A lot of schools were sadly forced to be in program improvement because they did not meet certain goals under NCLB, and uh, our school was not. We were pretty lucky, um, but also pretty diligent and hard working and trying to get our kids to, to meet the standardized testing goals, but we never gave up on the broad curriculum that includes science, includes the arts, drama, um, includes outdoor education, includes PE, includes recess. All those things are so, so important. And uh, that continues to this day. It continues to be one of our focuses, is to make sure that our kids are getting a broad-based education. Um, so that's another reason I think we've been successful. Um, the staff at Cobb School are just incredible. So Tony, why don't you and David start by asking each other questions? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I love that you were an archaeologist. That's what I studied in my master's program. So. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh. 
Yeah. Like a small world. Yeah. 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 And I, was there a particular focus within the world on archaeology that you... Um, the Near East. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. In Jordan and Turkey. I worked in Jordan and Israel. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Where in Jordan? Uh, we were in an area known as Wadi Fainan. Uh, it's it's like early early uh, Bronze Age, Calcolithic early Bronze Age, where they were um, manufacturing uh, metal, the beginnings of making metal tools. And it was a, a mining area. Okay. How was that Bir Makur? I was Bir Bir Makur, which is at the base of the mountains leading up to Patra, and it was a spice room. Oh, wow. So, millennia later. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Any other question, Doc? That Mike. Well, for the for for those of us like me who don't don't know, um, David, maybe could you explain a little more about the role of the little red schoolhouse that you mentioned? Um, it, it was the, to the best of my knowledge, and it's uh, very sparse knowledge. Um, it it was the local schoolhouse for the Cobb Valley area. And I, I, do you know, okay. Tony, how far, far, far back it was? Yeah, starting in the late 20s, early 30s, it was originally the clubhouse. So it's not, it's not bizarre to see it return that to that. And I think it lasted until the 70s. It was one yeah, of the last. research in the little red clubhouse. It was the last of the one room schoolhouses to actually, it's one room at a time because they had it on. But um, Dennis, in fact, I remember being a janitor there. Wow. And I know Cobb School opened in 85, actually uh, the day of the Valley Fire. The next day was supposed to be our Harvest Festival, and it was um, on the 30th anniversary. It was that, on the 12th, we were having the uh, celebration for the 30th anniversary of Cobb School. Um, my wife, Cindy, had reached out to a lot of former staff members, and um, Keller McDonald, who was the first principal of Cobb School, was going to be in attendance. and. As she was driving to the Moore Family Winery, where we were going to have this uh, reunion celebration, she called to let me know that she just drove through a fire on Ball sure. Rock Road, and that changed that, that plan changed considerably. <laughs> um, as far as you, you were asking about challenges, Nina, and I did want to just talk a little bit about some of those challenges, um, and it does tie into what Tony was talking about. You know, um, enrollment is really significant, and um, I know that uh, Catherine Stone, our superintendent, has requested that we have a, a little leniency this year in maintaining our ADA from, la from the beginning of last year so that we can kind of get through this push of rebuilding. Um, but one of, the, one of the major issues I see for, for, Cobb, for the Cobb community in particular is the fact that so many rental properties were destroyed. and. Um, I would encourage the audience to build rental properties in Cobb so that we can, um, you know, house people who can't afford to own their own homes. Um, the other, the other really big piece that's a, a huge challenge for Cobb uh, and the surrounding area is just the, the rise in real estate costs. You know, it's really unfortunate to see um, to see families unable to obtain a home or to build a home at a reasonable cost. It was one of the reasons that my wife moved here in the first place before I met her, you know? I mean, you go over the hill to Napa Valley and it's just crazy. Um, but it's beginning to get a little crazy around here too, and that's really unfortunate. Um, I, I don't have a good answer, but then I hope we can, I hope things get a little more leveled out and affordable again, though I don't know that they will. Um, some some other challenges. Uh, we're starting out our school year with a population of 133, so we're 81 percent of last year's starting school population. At one point, um, when Calpine had their headquarters on this side rather than in Geyserville, Cobb's population was 270, 270 wow. students. You know, we they. There's, we have many, many portable classrooms on our, on our site that are utilized for other purposes. We've converted some classrooms, like one is our instrumental music room, one is our garden um, instruction slash art room. We have, uh, we have a after school care room, a science lab. So it's not that the buildings aren't being utilized, but 
the property was certainly designed to house a lot more students than it does right now. Um, we did drop one teacher uh, at the end of this last year, but I do really hope that our, our I know that's not sustainable long term. Mm -hmm. um, the former superintendent had said, I think the ideal ratio of principal to teachers is 1 to 13, and we're pretty far from that at college school right now, 1 to 7. So uh, for sure, you know, and, and yet I, I, I do equate our success to our, our the nature of the small school setting. It's, uh, it's, pretty, it's pretty great when every teacher can know every kid, call them by name, support them. We get together, I guess I'll, I'll end with the last thing that we do that uh, in the Leslie Egan building, we, we um, on a weekly basis get together and have our assemblies. And I think uh, our weekly assemblies, it's, it's not necessarily curricular in nature, but what it does is it brings us all together. And that sense of community that we create on that weekly basis is uh, probably one of the most, it's, it's the last thing that I would get rid of. The first thing that I would keep, it really, really unifies us. So, yeah. What is the demographic of your school? We are largely white. It's, it's another anomaly. Uh, Cobb is this kind of bizarre island. We have very few second language learners. Uh, you know, you come to Middletown and it's more like 30%. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't know why that is. I mean, we do have some second language learners, but just a handful out of those 133 kids. I went to a, a meeting after, shortly after the fire that had to do with trees. Was that in that building that yes, you described? Yes, exactly. That's okay. the Leslie Eden Community Center. Okay, said. so now I know. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but you know, the, the thing that when you look at Cobb and Mini Cannon and Coyote Valley Elementary Schools, the thing that we have in common is um, the poverty level is about the same. We're, we're almost all 50% where our students are receiving free or reduced lunch prices. Mm -hmm. That's pretty significant, especially when you think about these rising costs of, of real estate here. It's, it's not going to happen if we, you know, if we can't find a way to, to get more houses. Okay, Tony, you want to come back and see if anybody has questions for you? Oh, no, stay. Keep. <laughs> yeah. Don't go away. Stay Both, of you are. Both of you are on. <laughs> any questions for any of us, either of us? Um, I'm curious about that uh, that legal case that you mentioned with mm -hmm. the Middle Creek School District. Uh, in what court was that? Courthouse Museum in Lakeport. Okay, the Superior um, Court. Lake that would have been the Superior Court. Mm -hmm. Okay. And there was no appeal, so, so never went in beyond that. Did that set a statewide precedent? It was um, used in part for what would. It didn't because another one in Mendocino did a bigger. Um, and the, uh, about 10 years later. So this one didn't set a state precedent like one would hope. Now had they, had the judge ruled that um, requiring integration, I'm sure it would have. But because he waffled, waffled that wasn't the case. The other, no, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, the other thing I was wondering was, I think you said the Little Red Schoolhouse uh, closed in about 1972. Sometime in the 70s, 70s yes. sometime, okay. And Cobb opened in 83, 85. 85. So students used to go to Mini Cannon from, from the Cobb that area. Was what happened American. in between. Mm -hmm. I guess they were bust, probably. Actually, our secretary, Karen, went to Mini Cannon, mm. and she's a long term Middletown mm -hmm. resident. And it's interesting because Cobb has always been such a unique community. Um, and a time where uh, Lake County was, uh, was experiencing consolidation. Uh, school districts. So you had term 1900. There was 44 school districts in Lake County. So that's 150 some, <laughs> if not more, elected trustees that were running, and it just wasn't a tenable situation, and it was just not financially yeah. willing to work. And so what they started to do is consolidation, which was two or more uh, districts coming together, pooling their money, have, sharing a single entity, a single governing structure. Cobb resisted that, and. They finally compromised in the 30s and said, fine, we'll consolidate with, with Middletown, but we're going to keep our, our darn school still. So our students are still going to get taught on Cobb Mountain, 
even though things have we'll not be changed. a part. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's a unique. It, it's persistent. Mm -hmm. You know that the community you're talking about that has this historic. It's, 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 it's a great community. Yeah. Hmm. The, uh, is there a declining enrollment? There should be a program. That if you had declining enrollment this year prior, the state funded you at the level of the year before for one year. Is that still in place? So far, yeah. And, and I really think, um, given the slow process of rebuilding, I think it would be in our best interest to get uh, Mike McGuire or others to extend that out one more exactly. year. Really, it's really not, it's not, ha I mean, speaking from personal experience, and in the loss of our home, we have yet to break ground. We don't have permits for our house yet. We think we have a plan. <laughs> Pretty sure we've got a plan at this point. And now we've got a structural engineer. But you know, it's taken us so much longer. We had 80 trees on our property that had to come down. PG&E didn't take them down, and neither did Caltrans. And the insurance said, we don't insure the forest. And so, you know, and, and you could get, I'm sure, as Tony is in the process of collecting, story after story through the oral history project of you know all those individual individual stories and the trials and tribulations of, of each family that's lost a home or a neighborhood you know and it's it's crazy so yeah we we for sure need yes. to petition further help um, has the school district done that i i don't know i'll i'll i'll, I'll, I'll talk to Catherine I'll about it to help out with my employer's office. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. And there's another aspect, those that lost properties, which you got when you revised tax bill, it's a 75% decrease. Oh, okay. That's, mm -hmm. um, so in the school district, it's 55% of the property taxes. Uh -huh. So there's, an, so, and there's a one year backfill from the state We're on the property tax revenue. To be perfectly honest, we're probably not gonna get that extended. Yeah. So it's, yeah. It's um, other future the concerns it's not for sure. Yet really hit. Right. Mm -hmm. No, it hasn't, and it hasn't yet. Um, but and uh, you know, thinking about in terms of property tax and the funding for schools, uh, it's nice to see some. You know, you've got this real varied um, rebuild process where you have some folks doing modular homes, and you have um, some really nice unique stick built homes that are that are custom made and um, it's gonna it'll be interesting how all of that pans out too you know because it, it is quite different that's our base i have a, a question for you <laughs> um driving through the cop area and the heart not carbon springs the uh Hilbert. anderson springs anderson springs anderson. yes thank you and and Hobart as well there are so many so many vacant lots and um, one of you mentioned uh, the number of people who rented homes uh, in the Cobb, Cobb area in particular I know about and um, I was wondering has the county uh, applied for any funding for HUD subsidized housing to replace those rental we, units? We applied for everything under the sun. Does and, it look good? And, no. <laughs> But the, the one thing that is very positive is a group called Hope City. Mm -hmm. That is rebuilding homes and they're sweat equity homes. Mm -hmm. they're, they're a wonderful group. They based they plan on being here for about four years and they're serious about it. Great. So they're helping replace And homes. Habitat seems to really want to be involved as well. Yeah, the habitat, habitat, yeah habitat for humanity. Yeah. Their rules are different, but yeah. they're both feel good too. Yeah, yeah. yeah the, the county and I'll be perfectly the county budget it's broke. I understand that. You know, it's, yeah. it, it's broken. It's going to stay that way for a while. Right. So it's the outside help. Anderson Springs, for example, 100 and some odd lots cannot be rebuilt. A sewer wow. system, period. Can't. We've got two million. It's a 7.5 million dollar project. There are 19 properties paying taxes to them. They're wow. full value now. We've secured two million from the Department of Agriculture, Mike McGuire. Mm -hmm. We've got. Very close. It's, we're more than cautiously optimistic that the other 5.5 will be coming and moving forward with that project. Because mm -hmm. they need to be rebuilt. They do. They're and wonderful. And the ripple effect. We need the kids in the school. Mm -hmm. We need the people living here. Right. 
all, it always comes down to dollars and cents. Mm -hmm. We got the state's uh, attention because we said, without that, those properties are not going to be worth anything. You won't get any money either. All right. Money <laughs> well, does talk, doesn't it? Sadly, yeah. that's it. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, well, why doesn't everybody break and have some refreshments and chat with each other and make it a party, okay? Thank <laughs> <laughs> you. We do have copies of Tony's book for sale today. We'll have some every day that we're open, Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday. Yes. The book will be for sale here forever. Oh, great. Oh, great.